way, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And uh, verse number 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So just by those two verses, I think you can understand <clears throat> what I'll be covering today with the, with the Bible qualification, Qualifications for a Bishop, Part 3. It's all about your family. You've got to be a family man. If you have a desire to be a bishop, a family man has to be preaching. We've got this Gene Kim guy, right? This Ruckmanite on the internet. And I've had a lot of people say to me, this guy's a good preacher. Listen to him. He, he's not even married. Look, he might be the best preacher. Well, he's not. But he might be the best preacher ever. He might be the most eloquent speaker ever. But the fact that he can't read this qualification of a bishop to be married and have kids, he's not married, to be married and have kids, he can't work that out. Why am I going to believe anything he has to say? It's so important that if you have a desire to be a bishop, that you aim for these things. You know, and if, you, if you're lacking, that you're working toward these things. Because why should anybody in your church believe you when you just disregard the qualifications that are found in the Bible? So let's look at verse number four again. Uh, let's break this down slowly. One that ruleth well his own house. So obviously the house refers to the family. This bishop, this man must be a family man. And I'm really thankful that um, uh, in, in my previous work, a lot of people said to me, you're a family man. Okay? And I, I've been given responsibilities, things that would take up many hours of my time. And I remember once my, my boss saying to someone else, and I, I heard the feedback, says once Kevin works too many hours, once he realizes that his job is interfering with his family, he's going to quit the job because he's a family man. You know, and I'm glad. I'm glad people recognize that about me. Even though I give my best in my workplace, if things start to interfere with my family, I'm going to put my family first and make sure I still can provide for them, but I'm not going to let my family go uh, you know, down the garbage. It's important for the bishop to have his own house. He must have his own family. We already saw that he must be the husband of one wife, but now our attention turns toward the children. The second part of it says, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So first of all, before we get onto the children, it's not just having a house. It's not just having a family, but one that ruleth well his family. Okay? We all can, anybody can have a family. Anyone can get married and have a bunch of kids. Okay? And we all know that the man is the ruler. We know that the man is the head of the home. But you know what? As men, we can rule poorly. We can do a bad job being a leader. We can do a bad job ruling our own house. Obviously, if you're doing a bad job, it's going to become quite obvious to other people. And if you want to be that bishop, you want to have this office, you need to make sure your house is in order. That's your wife, okay? And that's your kids, all right? You, you've got to understand that the actions of your wife, the actions of your children can reflect upon you, okay? I'm embarrassed when my kids do something naughty, you know, especially the little ones, I'm embarrassed. You know, because I know my qualifications, I need to fix that in my family. I need to fix that. Well, now, thank God, most of my children, uh, you know, are pretty good. But of course, when they get into those years, you know, one, two, three years old, they're always pushing those boundaries, and those kids require a lot of work. So just because you've, you, you've met those qualifications while you're a pastor, you still need to make sure you maintain that, you know, with the subsequent ch children that you have while you're a pastor. <clears throat> so you've got to be one that rules well your own house. I'm just going to read to you. You don't need to turn there. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, it says, Remember them which have the rule over you. So you see, you, as a bishop, you can't just be the ruler of your house. The reason why that's so important to rule well is so you get the experience because God says you've got to rule the church. You know, you're the leader of the church. You're guiding the church. And the only way you're going to rule well in the church is if you first ruled well in your house. If you can't manage your wife, who loves you, your kids that are smaller than you, if you can't manage that, how in the world are you going to manage a bunch of strangers, you know, a bunch of people you know, in the church? How are they going to respect you when they see that you have no uh, leadership skills, where your family don't respect you, your kids are running all over you, you know, your wife doesn't listen to you, your wife speaks bad of you? How are they going to respect you as their pastor? It's so important. And uh, you know, um, <clears throat> I, obviously being a, a, a husband, being a father, is the best training ground. Say, I need to be trained. What, what, pastor Kevin, what do you recommend for training? I want to be a pastor. I want to serve in the church full-time. What do you recommend? Which Bible college? F 
family Bible college. <laughs> that's, that's, where, that's where you get your experience. That's where you get your training. Okay? Learn to be a loving father. Learn to be a loving husband. Learn to be a godly leader. Learn to be that spiritual leader in your house. You know, it should be, you know, for, for your family, it should be, well, you know, dad's the same. Dad's at home. He's a spiritual leader. He goes to church. He's the pastor. He's the same guy. It's, it's, it's not like this mask that you wear. You ought to be the same man in your family leading well your own house and ruling well the church. All right? Now, I would encourage you, one thing, just my advice, it's good to get as much experience of managing people as much as possible. Now, <clears throat> I've had lots of work where I've had to supervise people, manage people, and I'm really thankful to God about that, really thankful, because you, you learn a lot of things, especially when you're managing unsafe people. You know, you, you manage people that are having arguments, people that have problems at home, it reflects bad in the workplace. You, get a, you develop a lot of skills, you know, and one thing about the workplace is when you hire an employee, you know, I'll just give you an example. The, the, uh, the cost that was worked out to train somebody was like $10,000. So when you hire somebody, you sit down, you train them for several weeks where they can be efficient in their job, it was roughly $10,000 of business money spent on just hiring one person. Now, if that person's not doing a great job, you know, the, 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 immediate, the immediate thought is, well, let's just get rid of him and get someone else. Okay, I mean, that sounds logical, but remember, that's, that's $10,000 more now that you're investing in hiring and training another person. How much cheaper would it be to take that person that's underperforming and work with them closely, encourage them, guide them, give them the skills they need, work out their weaknesses, you know, put them together with someone else? That's going to be much more cheaper. More often than not, they're going to be successful. They're going to do well. You know, it might only be a couple of thousand dollars of tr further training that person needs than just getting rid of that person and getting a brand new person. Okay? That's something I learned in business. Okay? It's more affordable, it's more efficient, it takes less time to train the existing people than getting rid of people and, and starting all over again. Why is that important? Because in church, all right, I mean, I can't just get rid of people. <laughs> all right? I've got to make sure, like in a, in a workplace you can, like you're underperforming, you're not doing well, see you later. But in a church, that's not how a pastor should be thinking about his, the, the people in the church, right? Should be looking, okay, these people have weaknesses. I want to try to preach sermons that will encourage them. I want to try to be their friend. I want to try to, are we praying for that person? You know, I want that person to know that I love them. And if they have the confidence from their pastor, they have the confidence from other people in the church, they're more likely to become a great Christian. And, you know, there's been several people from my experience in my workplace where they were underperformers. You know, people look down on them. People have told me, get rid of that person. I'm like, no, give me some time with that person. Give me a month with that person. And I've turned them around to be great workers, even better than, than the ones that are around there, even getting promotions, you know, and, and they were poor, poor workers. They just needed some help. They needed some guidance, okay? That's what you're going to do well. You know, if you have the experience, guys, look, managing people is not really pleasant. There's been plenty of times I went home and I'm like, man, I, I wish I wasn't managing people. I just wish I was just working for myself. Many times. But now looking back, I'm really thankful for the things I've learned, the mistakes that I made, the things that I learned. You make mistakes, you learn from mistakes as well. You know, a bit of trial and error, you learn these things. I really encourage you guys, if you have that desire to be a bishop, yes, rule where you're on house, that's the primary place. But if you have the opportunity in your workplace to manage other people, go for it. I really encourage you. You're going to just learn other things, other skills. And honestly, the church, the workplace, the home, it's all the same. I mean, managing conflicts, managing problems. At the end of the day, so many things in the, in the business world, obviously I didn't pull out the Bible, okay, but many biblical principles I applied to the business world and they work, they work there as well, okay, so it's a great training ground, I know it's, it's not pleasant to manage people, but honestly if you have that desire, I'd really encourage you, try to get in a position where you're, you know, being a supervisor over other people, maybe not even a, maybe a trainer, maybe, hey, you know, you get any new employees, I want to put my hand up to train that person, great opportunity, great opportunity to develop, develop skills, okay. Uh, for you into the future. Now it also says here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, it says, having his children, let's just stop there for a minute, having his children. Now, uh, why people are so stubborn, I don't know, okay? But you have pastors that say, well, this only applies if you have children. I don't have children with my wife, therefore I don't have to have my children in subjection because I don't have any children. Look, let's look at it again. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children, meaning that the bishop's house must have children. 
It's a comma. What are you trying to do? Why are you trying to work around? People are crazy. Always trying to find loopholes. Now, is this a hard command, having children? I mean, look, even the unsaved world have children. The unsaved world gets married and has children. This, this isn't something God say like this is some super difficult thing that you need to do as a bishop. Look, this is just a minimal requirement. Just be a normal human being. Just be a, a common sense human being. You get married, you have children. Okay, great. You know, have your children. This is so important because so many pastors really try to work around this. All right? The man's house must have children. And if you say, well, you know, I can't have children. And look, I feel sorry. There, there, there are couples that struggle to have kids. All right? Now, here's the thing. If you have no kids or you only have one kid, one child, it says children, then you're not qualified to be a pastor. Now, that might upset you, but really, if you believe it's the law that opens and... I, I believe it's the law that opens and closes the wombs. The Bible is very clear about that. All right? Now, you have a desire. I want to be a pastor, but we're not having children for whatever reason. Okay? It's not happening. Well, just trust God. Trust God that maybe right now is not the time. Maybe later in the future, maybe you'll be able to have kids. Maybe the timing is not now. Or maybe it's not God's will for you to be a pastor. And if you can't have children, just be like, Lord, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to follow you. You haven't given me children. Therefore, this cannot be your will in my life. And look, could you imagine, look, that, that would not be God's will in your life. Could you imagine you're still making yourself a pastor anyway? I mean, how do you think you're going to have any success as a pastor, you know, a success in a church when you're, when you're going against the will of God in your life? No, if God doesn't want you to be a pastor, that's fine. When I married my wife, I was told that my wife would not be able to have children. I was fine with that. You know, I love my wife. I was, I was fine. With, well, at the time, I, wasn't, I didn't really have a strong desire to be a pastor or anything like that, okay? But still, I was fine with the Lord closing the womb, but I guess he wanted me to be a pastor eventually because the womb was definitely opened uh, in the future. But hey, that's so important. You know, if, if it's the Lord that closes and opens the womb and he's closed the womb, it's not your, it's not your, your place to be a pastor. You're going to mess it up. You're going to really mess it up. Now, it says that, let's keep look at, look at that verse again. Verse number four, having his children in subjection. So here's another way that people get around with it is, well, my wife and I, we can't have children, so we're going to adopt children. Or my wife, you know, was in a previous, hopefully not married, but in a previous relationship, you know, she's got children, so I've got my stepchildren here, okay? Now I've got children in subjection in my, in my house. Now look, I put a lot of emphasis on the natural reading of the text, okay? When you just read that, you know, um, when you just read that passage, one that ruler fell his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, what are you immediately thinking? Just naturally, just the natural reading of the word, you're obviously thinking these are biolo biological children of that man and his wife, right? I do not believe that stepchildren or adopted children causes you to meet that qualification. Again, it's the law that opens and closes the womb. Am I against stepchildren? No. Am I against adopted children? No. I think if people can take on stepchildren or adopted children and love them as their own, I think that's a beautiful thing. I don't, I don't know if I can do that. Now, obviously, that person has a great heart, a big heart for, for family and children. I think it's a wonderful thing if you can actually take on children that's not your biological, biological children and love them as much as your own children. I think it's wonderful. But still, you haven't met the qualifications, okay? You must have your own biological children. I truly believe that. You know, if you want to be ordained and, and uh, you don't have your own children, but you have adopted children, I will not ordain you, okay? It's not because I don't like you. Uh, it's probably a, you're a great person for taking on children that are not your own. It's great, but I still wouldn't ordain you. I believe you have to have your own biological children. Again, it's a law that opens and closes the womb, okay? If the Lord said, no, it's not for you. I'm going to close your womb then what are you doing when you're taking on other children that's not your own? You're working outside of the will of God for that purpose, okay? So that's something I strongly believe in. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, children, okay? So uh, adopted or stepchildren are not to be counted. Now, what if I have a desire to be a, a pastor, a bishop, but in my old life, maybe before I was saved, I had a previous relationship and I had children, not, obviously not married, but in a de facto relationship, I had some children with someone else, okay? And obviously now I'm married with, with my own wife. You know, we're going to have children. We have children. You know, do those children from the previous relationship, do they have to be 
uh, children in subjection with all gravity? Now, that's a challenging one. I'll give you my thoughts on this, okay? Now, <clears throat> my, my first thought, my, when I first came across, when I thought about that scenario, I would think yes. You know, my, my first thought is yes. Even your children from a previous relationship should be in subjection with all gravity. But now that I reflect on this, not because of any situation, just, just reflecting upon this as I was preparing the sermon, let's look at verse 4 again. Let's just break it down. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection. So obviously his own house is him and his spouse and his children in that family unit, in, literally in that. That's why the Bible uses the word house, because you're housed together, you're living together. That's that family unit, all right? Now, obviously, I do believe if you have a desire to be a pastor, a bishop, you need to be blameless as well, okay? So obviously, if you have children from another relationship, you need to be doing the best you can to, you know, provide, to be there for those children. I mean, if you completely neglect those children, like C.I. Schofield, you know, if you guys know about that, neglected his old wife, his old children, became a pastor, married someone else, obviously, you're not blameless. Obviously, you can't rule well. I think he was divorced anyway, that C.I. Schofield. But still, he completely neglected his children. Obviously, that would keep him, uh, that would make him blameless, uh, make him not blameless, and he would be disqualified as a pastor. But obviously, if you've had re- uh, children from a previous relationship because you, know, you didn't know the word of God, you were in sin, you weren't, you weren't saved, whatever, but you know, you've been saved, you're working toward these things, you now have your own house, your own uh, family unit, you're married, because remember, if, if it was a previous relationship without marriage, it wasn't really a house. It wasn't really a true biblical family. But if you do have that now with your wife and with your children, I do believe as long as that household is managed and doing well and you haven't neglected your kids, just still there for them, you know, they still have that respect for, for, for dad or whatever, then I do believe you're still qualified to be a pastor. Okay? So I, I didn't have that view a few days ago until I started to go through this and uh, thinking about this a little bit more. So the Bible's really emphasizing that man's house, that family unit, husband and wife, all right? Now, let's keep going. Let's go. Let's keep going. It says there, uh, having his children in subjection, okay, subjection. So clearly, the children have to be under the authority of their parents, under the authority of their parents. This becomes really obvious. I mean, all you have to do, go to the grocery store, go somewhere where there's kids with parents, and watch the kids, sorry, watch the parents ask something from the kids, issue a command, and just watch, okay? Now, if the kid obeys mom and dad, you know, put that down, or come over here, and they do those things, you know immediately that child is, under, is uh, uh, subjected under the parent's authority. But when the parent has to ask that twice, three times, and they're not doing it, they're not obeying mom, you know, they're, they're completely ignoring their parents, you know that child is not subjected unto the parents. So, you know, make sure if you're someone that wants to hold this office, that you train your kids to obey you the first time. The first time, okay? Because if they obey you the second time, well, that first time they weren't under your authority, they weren't subject under your authority, okay? They were under your authority the second time, but it should always be, that should be a mark of your family. It, you know, you, people look at your family and go, wow, you know, mom and dad, they issue command, the kids off, off they go and they're doing the job, or they're doing that task that, that, was, that was required of them, okay? Now, uh, why, again, why is that important? Because you're going to have subjects of your own in the church, okay? I mean, people have to be subjected unto the pastor, okay? So if, if you can't control your kids, your own kids, who you're with hours and hours, you know, you've got the opportunity to take that rod and smack them. They still can't follow you. They still can't obey you. What do you think you're going to do with grown adults in a church? You know, you're not fit to be a pastor if you can't do that simple thing. Now, I also believe your children, not only should they be subjected unto mom and dad in the home, but when you're in the church, we just mentioned that, they should be subjected unto the pastor, okay? Now, obviously, I'm not here to lord over the flock. I'm not here to command everyone, but you know what? If there's children that are disobedient, children that are mucking around or maybe too loud, and I say to the children, and they're not my own children, you know, kids, be quiet, or go and play over there or whatever, they should know, well, we're in church, it's church time, we're subjected unto the pastor, we should obey the pastor as much as we obey our parents in the church, church environment. Of course, totally different story if I go to a house and I'm issuing commands, that's not my place. But while we're in church, gathered together, the children should know at this point in time I'm under the authority of the pastor as well. All right, So that's a great thing. Uh, it, it's, it's quite clear 
to a lot of people once if your children are subject to answer the, the authority of the parents or if they're not. Now, um, <clears throat> please uh, keep your finger there and turn to Titus chapter 1 verse 6. Titus chapter 1 verse 6. So let's get a little bit more uh, information about this qualification because obviously in Titus chapter 1 we have the other qualifications of a bishop, but it has a little bit more information about the children here. Uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 6, the Bible says, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So you see, the bishop must have faithful children. All right. Now, that's not saying that all your children are saved. Because obviously you might have little children and what, do you not become a pastor until every child grows up? I mean, what if you keep having children? <laughs> like, you know, you're waiting a decade before every child is saved, then you can be a pastor. Now, being a faithful child is not saying that child is necessarily saved. I mean, hopefully they are. I mean, it's a major problem if your own children are not saved, you know. But obviously it's talking about their relationship with their parents. The children are faithful to their parents, okay? Again, that, that idea of parents issuing commands, telling them what to do, they follow through, they do what parents have asked, that is faithful children. And you know what? If you have children that do not obey you, they're not faithful children. They're unfaithful children, okay? And, you know, you need to correct that, okay? And obviously, I'm not just saying that as parents, but obviously we're all children of God. And when we sin, you know, we can be unfaithful to God. And sometimes the Lord will have to take out that rod of chastisement and correct us as well, okay? Just as the loving Father corrects us, we should also be people that correct our biological children as well. Okay, so faithful children, and then it says, <coughs> not accused of riot or unruly. Not accused of riot or unruly. So I'll just quickly read Colossians 3.20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the pastor. No, this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Okay, When people see obedient children, children that are not, are not rioting, that are, that, that are, are not unruly, People find pleasure in children. You know, people will find pleasure in children. I'll cover that in a, in a little bit more in a moment. But the word is riot there, not accused of riot. What does riot mean? It means a disturbance. Okay, when someone's rioting on the streets, they're making some type of disturbance. You know, they're trying to raise their voices, uh, disturb the proceedings or disturb the situation. Whatever, whatever it is, it means to be a disturbance. So, you know what? Children should be seated in church. You have, want to have this desire your children should know when it's church time, it's only a solid hour, a bit more than an hour. They should know to sit quietly in their seats. And you know what? And I know it is, it is challenging. It is challenging. But it's not a difficult command. I mean, think about it. Think about it. All right, kid, I need you to sit there for an hour. Don't move. All right, just look forward, pay attention, take in as much as you can. You know, you might want to give them a little thing to write on if, if they get a bit distracted. But hey, that's, that's not a difficult command command for a child to do. Obviously, we know the child is, wants to, you know, interact, child wants to get up and do things, but you need to teach your children not to be a disturbance, okay? And personally, I'm not really disturbed when I preach and there are children making noise. I'm not really disturbed. But again, I'm not necessarily as a pastor thinking of myself. Again, when we're preaching, we're thinking about the congregation. And, you know, obviously, we don't want the congregation to be disturbed by that, okay? This is why it's important for, for us to raise children that are not uh, writing, as it were. Their children should be seated in the church and, uh, and that, that they are within the control of the parents, okay? The other thing that it says is unruly, okay? Not, not writing or unruly. So what, that's pretty straightforward. We know what rules are. Children should follow the rules. Children should obey the rules. And when they're disobedient to the rules, they're being unruly, okay? They're not following the rules that God has, or the father, parents have given them, okay? So again, they should be obedient to the parents. We cover this. They should also be obedient to the pastor during church time. And you know what? If, if parents, if you're not there with your child, they should also listen to other adults in the church. Now, I'm not saying necessarily they should. What I'm saying is, obviously, they should be obeying mother and father. Mother and father should be there. But if for some reason mother and father are not there, then the child should also be aware of the other adults in the church. And if the adults, other adults say, hey, be, be a bit quiet, quiet or go over there, play over there, Children should follow that, okay? And uh, do they follow? Do they follow the rules? You need to make sure your children follow the rules if you want to have that. If you want to be a bishop, if you want to be ordained as a pastor. All right. Now, one way to check if you have faithful children. I already covered it, but 
Honestly, well-behaved children are usually praised, okay? And I'm not, honestly, please, I don't want you to think I'm boasting. I'm just, I want to set a good example. Many, and I, my children are not perfect. I know. I'm not saying my children are perfect. I'm not saying my children are the best children in the world. I'm not saying that, okay? But often, wherever we go with the kids, wherever, whatever country we've been, wherever shops, pools, just whatever it is, wherever we've gone, we've almost always had feedback on our children. And it's, it's positive feedback. It's not feedback, wow, you've got so many kids, though that does come, obviously, but wow, your children are so obedient. You know, I can't believe your children just sat there, you know, they went to get a haircut, they just sat there quietly waiting for their turn. I can't believe, I can't believe that. That's, that's really good, because here's the thing, parents, we can, give, we can be blinded by love. You know, we can be blinded by the love of our ch- children. Grandparents definitely can be blinded. <laughs> you know, they, they, they love to see, you know, mini versions of their own children running around. They can be blinded by, 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 the, by the love of their children. But when you have total strangers or even just other people in the church, you know, um, you know congratulate you for raising your children, you know, uh, be blessed by your children's presence, and they actually like talking to your children, you know, th- that gives you a great understanding. These children are faithful. These children are obedient. You know, people like these children because they're not writing, they're not unruly. So think about that. I don't, I don't know what people say about your children. I have no idea. But think about what people have said, and if people are giving you positive comments like that, about their, not about the numbers, but about your behavior, then you know you're doing a good job, you know? But if you're having people that kind of want to stay away from your children, maybe they don't want to say anything nasty, but, you know, they're not saying anything positive, you should take pause for a moment and say, hey, you know what, uh, do we have faithful children? You know, are we setting a great example with our children? And uh, that's so important, um, you know, for, for pastors to be, so important that you set a good example with your children. And again, it's the training ground. If you can't work, organize your children, how are you going to organize the church? I mean, it's a, it's a crazy thing, all right? So uh, let's look at verse number five now. And that's basically what I, just, what I just said there. Verse number five, it says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, this is common sense, right? How shall he take care of the church of God? <coughs> I mean, obviously, I think it's in brackets, like, obviously. You know, if you can't manage, you can't rule well your own family, your own wife, your own children, how in the world are you going to take care of the church of God? And um, <clears throat> let's talk about a little bit about, you know, ruling your own house and how that ties in with ruling in a church, being a pastor in a church. Number one, it's leadership. Number one, it's leadership. As, as the husband, as the head of your home, you're providing leadership in your family. You know, your family should be walking in the ways that you've set forward as a target, as a goal. You know, you're setting the example. Your wife, your children are following after you. And um, this is where, once again, this is where, you, you know, you want to try to gain as much experience as you can with your family. There's going to be times when your wife disagrees with you. There's going to be times when you make decisions that does not satisfy your children. They're, not, they're going to be whining about it. Hey, but you know it's the best thing for your family. You know, this is the way we need to walk. This is, this is what God says about, about things in His Word. And you've got to set that leadership. You've got to get people to buy in and understand why you're taking that position and go with it. Take a strong leadership position even when other people are not happy with that decision. It's the same thing that's going to happen in a church. Many times you're going to have to come and be, you, you have to be the leader. You've got to take it, you know, and control things. You've got to take ownership of it. If things aren't working in the church, you've got to, you know, instead of blaming brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, if something's not working in the church, I, I've got to own up to it. I've got to say, well, yeah, you know what? We need to change this. We need to make these things better. Maybe I need to preach about this topic or, or whatever, you know? And, and try to be that strong leader within uh, your, your church. So, you know, if you find success doing things a certain way with your family, then take those principles and apply it to your church. You know, you're going to find success in your church as well. You take those principles, apply it to your workplace. If you're a manager, you're going to find success in those things as well. Because God's knowledge is universal. He works everywhere. You know, God's knowledge works everywhere. So being a strong leader. The next thing with your family, obviously, is men. We need to provide for our families, right? We work hard. We provide an income. We put a roof over people's heads. We clothe the children with the, with the money that's been made. The kids are fed. Obviously, the wife carries out those kinds of household tasks, but you're the one that makes it possible for your wife to be able to do that, okay? You're the one that brings provision. And uh, I'm going to quickly read to you. If you guys can go to First Peter, please. Turn to First Peter. First Peter. I'm going to read to you from John chapter 21, verse 16. John 21, verse 16. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? 
he said, and he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. All right. So why do we provide for our families? Because we love our families, don't we? We love our families. We want to provide for them. Jesus says to you know pastors or to church leaders, if you love me, feed my sheep. You see, you provide for your family and for the church family, you're also required to provide for the church family. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. It says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraints, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords of a God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. So that love of provision, you know, I want to I wanna feed you guys, and I want to feed you the Word of God. I put a lot of effort in my sermons, you know, I don't think, again, I'm not the, the best preacher, but I put a lot of work, I try, I try to study my Bible deeply, I try to find some deeper truths to feed you guys the Word of God, to feed that new man, because I want to provide for the family. I want to, not family, well, that's one thing, but provide for the church, you know, so we can all grow in the Lord. The third thing I've got here as a father to, the, to the, your family and then also to your church. If you guys can go to Acts chapter 20, please. Acts chapter 20 is as a husband, as the head of your family, you're there to protect your wife and kids. Protection. Protect your family, right? Of course, you don't want someone to come into your house. I mean, look, if someone breaks into your house, are you expecting your wife to get there and, and, and take them down? Are you expecting your little children to rise up? I mean, one day I will. You know, when all my when all my kids are teenagers and like eight, you know, smelly eighteen year old, nineteen year olds, so I'd be I'd be worried someone breaks into the house. And all these all these men just you know. But really, it, it's it's the role of the man, right? It's the role of the father to put his life at risk to protect his family. You know, it's the same thing for a church. Now I got to come here and I got to think I got to yes provide, but I've got to also protect this church. Acts chapter twenty verse thirty, it says, "Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things." to draw away disciples after them. Look, also of your own selves. The Bible says there'll be people in our church that we think were brethren, that we thought loved us, that we love them, that they're going to rise up speaking perverse things, drawing away disciples after them. Look, <clears throat> they really were in the church. So, and then in verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not, to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is why it's important for us as pastors to preach against false prophets. You know, to, 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 to warn people of the red flags that we see in the Word of God. I wasn't aware, because, you know, going to, you know, your average Baptist church, people don't really preach against false prophets that much. I mean, they'll preach against the Catholic church and, you know, those things that have nothing to do with our local church. But hardly ever would they ever preach about our own local church having false prophets. You know, and this is why they rise up. This is why they get ordained. They become pastors. They take over the next generation of the church. And then next thing you know, they're preaching some other gospel. All right? We need to be aware. I need to make sure I, pro I protect this church, even its people within this church that I loved, that I thought was my brother, but you're speaking perverse things. We need to get rid of that person, protect the church. Okay? Just as much as you want to protect your own family, I should have that call to protect this church. And obviously, I love my kids. Obviously, I love my wife. Obviously, there are going to be people in church you may not necessarily get along with, but you've got to find that love for the brethren, right? You've got to find it and protect them just as much as you protect your own wife and kids. Now, just a quick one, decision-making. I think I touched on it a little bit. Obviously, you're not going to please everybody with your decisions, you know, but that's what you do as, as, as fathers. You make decisions. It's not always going to please wife and kids. Same thing. In church, you're going to have to make decisions. It does not please everyone. But your goal is obviously to please the Lord. Okay? Your goal is always to do the best you can for your church, even if not everybody makes everybody happy. At the end of the day, if you make a decision and people aren't happy, a few weeks later they'll, they'll get over it. Okay? They'll get over it a few weeks later. Uh, the next thing is putting out fires. Okay? So a great experience with having a lot of children, that I've, I've gained a lot of experience here, is that children often have conflict. Okay? In the workplace, employees would have conflict all the time. And I love taking the biblical principles. Now, I think I already taught on this, but just I'll repeat it once again. You know how the Bible says that when your brother has offended you, go to that person alone, you know, and not spread it abroad and, you know, just take it to that person alone first? I thought, does this work in the workplace? Let's try it out. You know, I had a lady come up, this person has done this, you know, telling me all these bad things, and I stopped her and I said, look, I don't mind hearing it. Obviously, it's my responsibility to know what's going to the workplace. 
But have you gone to that person one-on-one -on -one yet? He goes, no. I said, look, right now, take 15 minutes. I'll cover the floor. I'll take care of things. Go. Next 15 minutes, take that person into that office. No one's over there. Go and talk it out, and then let me know how things went. Done. Best friends. <laughs> Came back. They worked well. It all got sorted out. Biblical principles, you know, that apply. But you've got to make sure that, uh, you know, you're aware that there's always going to be fires when you have groups of people. It's normal. It's natural. You know, don't, don't panic when there's conflict. Don't panic when someone doesn't like another person. You don't need to panic. But make sure that the biblical principles are being followed. You know, uh, you remind those people about those things, and hopefully they apply it, and they can get over uh, the conflicts. Okay? Love. Love. John 13, verse 35 says, Jesus speaking, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. And you know what? As a pastor, you are being a disciple. You are being a follower of Christ. Why? Because Christ was the chief shepherd. And God has made you as a pastor the under-shepherd, okay, to look after the flock. So you are a disciple in that sense. You're following after Christ as a shepherd. It says, uh, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Love one to another. If you say to me, I want to be a pastor, I just don't have love for the brethren. You need to work on that. I'm not saying you're not qualified, or actually you aren't qualified at that point in time, but you need to work on that and, and build in that qualification. If you just find, I just don't have the love, it's not, it's not for you. You know, you, your church will know if you love them or not. They'll, they'll start to know. They'll start to know this person does love us or this person doesn't love us. And I've seen people leave churches simply because they feel like the pastor has no love at all for them. You know, maybe that pastor has favorites, you know, or, or maybe the pastor just has no love whatsoever. But Jesus Christ, this is how people are going to know you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. Of course, that's a command for all of us, but I would say especially a pastor who's following after Christ in that role as a shepherd, all right? And uh, my last point, my last point is this, dedication and commitment. Listen, when you said, I do, to your wife, you said, till death do us part, okay? For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, you made that vow to keep it. This marriage is going to last forever, or as long as, you know, till death do us part, okay? Dedication and commitment. You need to be dedicated to your family. Of course, that's what we should be striving to do as men. But why is that so important? Because when you become a pastor and you start a church, you need to be committed and dedicated to the church. Look, I did not come here. Let's just try it for a year and see how things go. If the church doesn't grow to 100 by then, I'll just go back to Sydney. There's more people there. I'll have more success there, I think. Oh, okay. When I came here, I've come with dedication, commitment. We're going to make this church work. You know, I'm here. I'm going to serve for as many years as the Lord would have me. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I love it up here anyway. You know, but other pastors, and look, part of that is meeting the qualifications. Part of that is meeting, because when you realize I have these qualifications, I need to work toward these things in order to be qualified to be a pastor, then it, it takes effort, doesn't it? You've got to, oh, I've got a weakness here, I've got to fix that. And this is an area that I need to work on. And you put effort into meeting those qualifications. And because it takes effort, then you're more likely to be committed to the work that you take. But pastors that are self-ordained, you know, pastors that never met the qualifications, you know, the saying is, easy come, easy go. All right? It's, it's easy for me to get ordained. I got ordained or I'm self-ordained or whatever it is that they do. Do you think they're going to really care if the church is successful? That's easy come, easy go. I got ordained, church started, it's not working. Ah, let's just quit. We'll start somewhere else. We'll go somewhere else. We'll do something else. Now, as a pastor, you need to be dedicated. And look, because you should be asking the Lord's leading in your life. You should be saying, Lord, where do you want me to go? Whatever you need to use, if it's people in my life, or, you, you know, you make it clear to me where I need to go. I know you told us to go into all the world. I guess at the end of the day, every place is correct. But you want to be in the will of God as much as possible. You know, ask the Lord to lead you where you need to be, you know. And then when he takes you there, you need to have the confidence this is where God wants me. I'm not going to quit if the church doesn't grow. I'm not going to quit if it's just my family plus one, two years into it, three years into it. No, if the Lord wants me here, I'm going to be committed to that. All right, you got to have that dedication and commit the same dedication you should have to your wife, to your children. You should have that for the church, you know. That's why patience is so important. That's why patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's one of the requirements of a pastor. It's because things aren't always going to go as quickly as you wish. But you know what? If, if you have, I have the confidence, I have the faith, the Lord wants me right here on the Sunshine Coast. 
I do. I'm, I'm not going to quit on this church ever, okay? Ever. You know, it's not going to happen. I mean, the worst, I mean, I could, I could get unqualified or something. Oh, no way. It's not even in my mind, you know? But I, I guess, you know, you've got to always be careful because we have the sinful flesh that we always got to be aware we need to be walking in the Spirit, make sure we don't become unqualified or anything like that. But as far as I'm concerned, if something happened to me, I hope this church will be strong enough that I've already worked, that I've invested my time, the Lord has worked in people's hearts, the Holy Spirit has moved, that this church will be like, you know what, this is a church of God where, where, you know, we're not just one person, we're not just Pastor Kevin, this is a church of Christ, we're going to continue this church and ask the Lord to lead us to another pastor. If that ever happens, I'm, not, I'm hoping it never happens, right? But if that's what's required, then I hope, you know, the church is strong enough for that, that I've dedicated myself, that I've committed enough to this church so it wouldn't just fall apart like that, okay? So don't be a pastor of easy come, easy go. I'd rather make your efforts to become a pastor or a deacon or whatever harder than it needs to be so you can really appreciate the work. When you go into it, you can really appreciate, wow, I put my effort into this, took this many years, you know, now I'm ready to take this on board. You're going to be much more dedicated to it. Let's pray.